My name is Andrew Krandrosh. I'm a fourth year at ERG, the Energy and Resources Group. The title of my talk is Black Powder, Red Soil, More Crops, Biochar, Technology Adoption, and Carbon Sequestration in Western Kenya. Agriculture and soil carbon in Sub-Saharan Africa. So most Africans are farmers. It's kind of an obvious thing a lot of people sometimes don't think about. There's a broad consensus that soil fertility is declining um, in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, soil fertility, particularly in, humid, uh, in, in the humid tropics, is mediated by the presence and loss of soil organic matter. It provides a lot of functions in soils. It, um, it uh, helps retain nutrients, it can provide, provide a source of nutrients, it provides substrate and habitat for beneficial soil microorganisms, it helps hold water, does a lot of things. Natural ecosystems over sort of long time scales uh, create soil organic matter at the same rate that they lose it when those natural systems are converted to agroecosystems, they tend to lose it quite rapidly and eventually get down to a, a lower equilibrium so amount of soil carbon. That, that happens particularly fast in the humid tropics where moisture and warmth facilitate microbial decomposition. Um, there's a good bit, good bit of evidence, um, both from sort of natural scientists and from agricultural economists, that um, the effectiveness and the profitability of inorganic fertilizer is quite me mediated quite a bit by soil organic matter. Generalizations are always wrong, but this, this sort of speaks to maybe, there, maybe, there's, maybe there's something to an idea of a natural resources poverty trap, maybe. Again, generalizations are, are wrong. So what is biochar? Biochar is basically the same thing as black carbon, which is also called pyrogenic carbon, which is basically the same thing as charcoal. It's the product of thermal decomposition of, of biomass in the absence of oxygen. Um, or incomplete combustion in the substoichiometric sub read no oxygen or li limited oxygen environment. Basically, you take biomass, you add heat, um, you get biochar plus combustible gases, which can then be burnt to produce heat, which can drive that reaction. So in a wildfire, you're going to have good mixing of oxygen, you're not going to get much char. If you, do it, if you do this process under controlled conditions, you get the heat without the oxygen, and you can produce a lot of biochar, and the gases go somewhere, ideally burnt. Uh, when, when biomass is heated, sorry, in the absence of oxygen, when there's oxygen, it simply burns. Without oxygen, the heat causes changes in the chemical structure of biomass that make it less edible to soil microbes. So it gives it a really long persistence in soil. Um, this is data that I analyzed from um, Anisha Singh paper in the uh, Biogeochemistry Journal um, with pyrolysis temperature, or residence time in soil, that's years, as a function of pyrolysis temperature in Celsius. This here is a lower bound. It's probably the most conservative estimate I could give you based on data. It's assuming a mono-exponential decomposition rate, um, whereas a two-pool model with some some of it going fast and some of it staying for a really long time is probably more realistic. And it also, the other reason it's a lower bound is that this is grass char, and grass char is going to be, for various reasons, I could go into the most labile as opposed to stable in soil. And you said that's years? Years. Yeah, so as you get it baked up to a, to a certain degree, you're going to get it to last a long time. Um, and this is a lower bound figure. That's, this is, um, these are a thousand wild bootstraps, because the data is weird, um, with conf confidence intervals based on that. And these are fitted values, not, not slope coefficients. Turns out when you add biochar to soil, you can very often improve crop yields. Um, this is just a histogram from 41 studies that looked at crop yields of all sorts of different crops and all sorts of different conditions. And it's, it's variable, but um, on average, uh, you get increases in yields. Um, it's got a really long tail. I cut off part of the tail. One of the interesting things when you look at all these studies is you, know, you find modest benefits to some soils. You find no benefit in others. Sometimes in really terrible soils, you see, you see the ability for plants to, be, to start growing where they couldn't really grow very well at all before. So biochar in Western Kenya, there is, in recent years, maybe the past, maybe the past 10 years, there's been an explosion in scientific literature on this. The whole idea of sequestering carbon while increasing crop yields, particularly in bad soils, is appealing, right? But very few examples of use by farmers. So in 2011, I, I applied for and got a little $5,000 grant from Innovations for Property Action through this thing called the Graduate Student Fund to scope an RCT in Western Kenya where I had heard about a few early adopters maybe doing some biochar test plots or something. So I went there and I was very surprised to find that a thousand households had been using biochar for between one and three years. Um, I was totally shocked and I hadn't done my IRB so I couldn't do anything because um, <laughs> I didn't expect this to happen. I quickly found a researcher from Oxford. Uh, she was a master's student at the time. She was now at Edinburgh doing a PhD. And she had, she had gotten better information than me and had already filled out her human subjects. Um, so we collaborated and got a 360-person recall-based panel from these people um, 
of crop yields and stuff like that, and went and analyzed it. She had been there to do sort of sort of qualitative assessments of people's agricultural systems and biochar. So these farmers were using waste charcoal dust and cooking fire residue. So if any of you have ever been to Sub-Saharan Africa, you've probably seen by the side of the road people selling charcoal. People use the lumps for cooking, and when they make charcoal, there's a lot of dust left over. It's fine biochar, uh, although you can't really use it for cooking so much. Um, people also, unfortunately, cook um, with really inefficient types of cook stoves and other cooking means, which can leave black unburnt bits, which while the, you know, while um, inefficient cooking isn't really a bad thing, it does give you biochar. These, these trainings happened by a small Kenyan NGO called ACON, which is the, de definitely a very grassroots group. They were sort of unfortunate, they sort of named themselves, well they did name themselves the African Christians Organization Network. Basically, this guy named Salim um, heard about biochar through some grapevine, made a test plot on his own farm, saw big increases, and started, basically, he, al he already had like a small NGO promoting improved cook stoves, and he just started doing biochar trainings um, with first the people in his area, and then started, started passing word of mouth um, to other sort of self-organized community groups, steadily increasing away from where he started in his home village. The timing of that, roll, the rollout of that training is plausibly exogenous, lends itself to a difference in differences. Does anybody not know what a different diff is? A what? Difference in difference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an estimation strategy whereby um, you treat something as, it's a quasi-experimental estimation strategy, whereby you can figure out a causal estimate, if not if the allocation of technology is random, but the timing of it is random, or of a thing that you're interested in. Um, uh, so I saw a lot of pictures like this. Biochar on the right, not on the left. Um, the, the woman here on the right is the farmer, and that guy, um, <coughs> Joseph, was helping me to pilot the survey. This picture is not particularly scientific. Um, <laughs> so there's biochar on the right and not on the left, but that's not the only difference between them. You see here, uh, these are beans, beans fix nitrogen. Um, and this woman, when she added biochar, the way she, the way she did it was that she, you know, as most Kenyan farmers do, they have a big pile of cow manure somewhere, um, and she'd mix the biochar in with that and put them up together. This isn't a particularly scientific comparison, but I would see a lot of pictures with this being sort of the upper end of how dramatic it gets. If anybody's interested in, in um, the question, think that things besides biochar might have changed with biochar, it's an interesting question that I'm happy to go into a little bit later, but, but the short version of the answer is that um, absolute rates of, of of manure use didn't really change. Um, people might have mixed it with biochar, but people are people are usually manure constrained. We can't really expect that rates of you know rates of organic fertilizers changed when people went to biochar. But but anyway, the most conservative thing that I can say is that all the results that will follow are the yield benefits and profitability benefits of Acon's training and all that that entailed. And I can make a different argument that that's just biochar. So later adopters back to the different diff thing. Later adopters are used as counterfactuals for earlier adopters. Uh, like I said, Akon's training spread to new areas largely by word of mouth, and later, later adopters are generally further away from the place where Akon's head lives. These, these lines, these are, these are months of adoption since January 2008, and these lines rep represent rough demarcations of Kenya's agricultural seasons, the long and short rains. Long rains, uh, we're right in the middle of them right now, we're there. Um, the short rains are in the second half of the year. Yields are roughly double in the long rains than the short rains. Also, I forgot to mention anywhere in these slides, we're talking about maize here. Um, entirely, I, I, I don't have good data on other crops. Anyway, you see, you see two big spikes and one small spike of adoption um, in these seasons. I, I, I focus only on, on these three seasons and use later adopters as counterfactuals for, um, for what would have happened to earlier adopters had they not adopted. And these guys have observable trends in time-varying variables that I, sorry, they have common trends in time-varying variables that I observe. I, have a, I can show that to anybody if they're interested. So, first thing, farmers used less fertilizer after they started to use biochar. Farmers, you talk to them and they complain about the price of fertilizer, how it's gone up in recent years. People want to, these, these people are largely subsistence. They're trying to get enough food so they don't have to buy it on the market, um, which leads them to reduce fertilizer expenditure if they can get their crop yields up a different way. So, you, you have to first estimate this. This is simple fixed effects regression. Fertilizer as a function of starting to use biochar, whether or not it's a short range and using biochar in the short rains, time period dummies, individual dummies. Um, it turns out that when farmers started using biochar, 
they roughly halved, on average, their fertilizer expenditures. That's huge. Um, uh, next question is what happened to their crop yields? Um, so, so here, um, please. How much fertilizer were they using to begin with? Not much. Um, I, have, I, have, I have that on a picture, on a figure later, so you'll see it. But, um, but there's a substantial group not using any. Um, and then, to, like, recommended rates by, by Kenyan agricultural authorities are about 50 kgs of CAN and DAP per acre. Yeah. Average is about half of that. So is that determined in option, like whether someone's or using fertilizer kind of determine their adoption rate of using biochar? Um, so one You're thing, that, that's, that's a great question because it reminds me that I forgot to mention all of this data is adopters. Nobody oh. in my data set is not an adopter. I'm comparing like to like here. Because, um, you know, it's entirely possible that those who adopted biochar are different somehow than those who didn't. Mm -hmm. So I want to get around that question. So it seems like you, you have, you're comparing early adopters and late adopters on um, the argument that late adopters are late just because of the uh, Um. Yeah, ba basically, um, geography and that they hadn't, word hadn't gotten out to them yet. So Akon basically worked by word of mouth. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, what, what I'm assuming for identification is common trends. And I can partially test it, and I've got, I've got you know, kernel densities of trends, and they're not really that different from each other later, I can show you. Um, it's not perfectly testable. Could, could you do the, the same thing, just like a geographic instrument on, on adoption? Mm. It'd be noisy because um, it's going to follow roads, for example, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, if I had some sort of social network distance, maybe, or something like that, but, um, yeah. I have two questions about the, related about the fertilizer uh, usage. So, did the training um, involve, I mean, did, were they told during the training that they wouldn't have to use as much fertilizer if they used biochar? And, um, so, you know, do you think people just took that as a given, given that, you know, this is a huge chunk of their, of their incomes? Do they just trust the traders and say, oh, yeah, okay, I'll just cut down on the fertilizer, I'll, I'll take that risk? The answer is yes and yes. Um, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it was more like you can use manure and save money, not you shouldn't use fertilizer so much. Although, mm -hmm. you know, it's well known and the trainers weren't shy about talking about how fertilizer can and does acidify soils. Mm -hmm. And in the tropics, that's bad news. Um, you know, that's, I mean, that's a pretty big effect. Um, yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, these are adopters, and maybe they're willing to try new things or differently in certain ways. I mean, if I if I did this on randomly selected people, maybe a little different. So, just to push a little more on the gif, and gif I think one of the things that I would worry most about would be that the best farmers adopted first because they were good farmers and they also know a lot. Um, yeah. So, do you see common trends in yields before? Yeah. Okay, I, d I do. Value and all the things that, okay. Yeah, common trends, definitely d le differences in level. Uh, I, d I didn't mention it on the slide, but it's in the paper. I, um, I, um, I weight later adopters to be similar to early adopters. Um, just, uh, you know, common trends isn't violated, but it's possible that there are common trends that I don't observe um, that where the, assumption isn't, where the assumption is violated. So in order to sort of head my bets on that, I weight everybody to make it more similar before I run that regression or during the version, I suppose. But good point. Well, anyway, yield. Um, I model it as a function of individual dummies, fixed effects. Um, beginning to use biochar, which is a dummy. Yield is obviously influenced by fertilizer. Yield, um, the effect of fertilizer is most likely going to be different when people start using biochar. Um, the effect of fertilizer is most likely going to be different in the short range for various reasons. And it's entirely possible that the effect of that that effect in the short range is different when people start using biochar. And time period dummies, um, in addition to the short range dummies, and one of them gets dropped. Um, you see, you don't see betas here, you see functions. Um, there's no good, re well first off, it's well known that plant response to fertilizer is nonlinear. Um, that the shape of that curve varies with all sorts of factors. Um, there's no good reason to, I, I don't want to specify a functional form because I don't know it. Um, and I know even less about the functional form of these additive interaction terms. So how does the response to fertilizer change when um, people start using biochar? It's just, I don't know. 
Um, so I estimate via something called generalized additive models or penalized splines. I've got some reserve slides on that that I can go into later if anybody's really interested in, in the mechanics. But basically, um, it fits a number of, it, you, 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 the short version, which I can elaborate on later, afterwards if anybody's interested, is you, you fit a bunch of, um, or I can even go to a little bit now, but you, you put a bunch of splines over, over, the, over, the, um, over the run of the data, um, and then you estimate a penalty term which constrains their influence, which makes them not be so jumpy, but makes them smooth out quite a bit. Um, uh, I don't think this has been used in econometrics, and it's relatively new in statistics on its own. There's some really good textbooks on it that have come out recently. Anyway, um, what did I get? So think of these, um, think of these, of these uh, solid lines. Uh, first off, I should say that these histograms superimposed are densities of fertilizer use, densities of fertilizer use in the short range, densities of fertilizer use among those using biochar, and biochar in the short range. Um, think of the solid lines as regression coefficients, <coughs> except that they're not lines, they're wiggly. Um, and the, um, and the, the red lines, the faint red lines, are 1,000 wild bootstrap, cluster wild bootstrap iterations um, with confidence intervals. So basically, clustered on village, so w within which individuals are nested. Um, so what did I find? Um, it turns out, over most of the supported distribution, which is the relevant part, fertilizer makes crops grow better. No real surprise. Um, when people start using biochar, you get this additive effect, which takes off that a little bit. Um, but what to look at here is, among that substantial group that's using very little or no fertilizer, we have yields, sorry, this is, this is, the, this is the slope of this term, plus the, the dummy on the, on the treatment effect. Um, you get an average of about one and a half extra bags of maize, 90 kg bags of maize per acre. Um, over here it's significant too, I wouldn't read too much into it, but essentially it's, it's, it's positive and statistically significant for a whole lot of people in the sample, um, depending on how much fertilizer they use. Um, the interaction, it also turns out that fertilizer is a little less effective in the short range, and I don't really think I have anything significant to say about um, differential effects of the treatment in the short range season. Um, you, so the way to think about this is that two things are changing at once, right? People are starting to use biochar and they're starting to use less fertilizer. Um, if you're interested in sort of a average treatment effect or distribution of treatment effects, you're interested in how um, those two things change at once and how those map the outcomes. So that's what this is. Um, upper panel, this up, up top there on the left is the <laughs> estimated treatment effects, basically the, the fitted values minus the estimated fixed effects, minus the residuals, minus the time period dummies, um, uh, and a kernel density of, um, of how much I estimate for that combination of things that people did, um, their yields changed. Um, that's yields. This is profitability, which is simply, um, sorry, both of these are the long range. This is profitability, which is simply estimated as dollars per, dollars per amount of maize minus dollars per fertilizer. Or, or not dollars, but ten shillings for the amount of fertilizer they use. Um, this is the same thing in short range, it's not significant, but um, estimated treatment effects, and sorry, the dotted lines are medians. Um, it seems like we get small jumps in yield because people use less fertilizer, and fertilizer makes crops grow better. Um, but fertilizer also costs money, um, and when they use less, they got more per dollar they spent. Um, another thing to mention about this is that only portions of farms were amended with biochar. Um, these people were using waste charcoal dust that they found in various places and cooking residues from cooking fires. They didn't have enough to amend their whole farms, yet I don't have plot level data. This is whole farm data. So one, I think I can speculate with a good amount of confidence that um, had people not been supply constrained, these results might be bigger. Do you assume there's no opportunity cost of uh burying your charcoal dust versus somehow finding a way to burn it? Thanks for mentioning that. Um, uh, I assume that I omit it from this. I assume that it's small. Okay. Um, there were a few people I talked to anecdotally who were buying bags of charcoal dust from people who made charcoal. Um, that was rare. Um, and it was cheap. Um, especially compared to fertilizer. Um, 
and uh, the other costs would be like you know walk and go get it or um, having to spread it, but they typically spread it together with their manure. Um, so that that does confound us a little bit, but I don't think it's that much. I don't think I can say anything better than that. Um, can I ask one more question? Related? Please. Is there, in this context, is there any briquetting industry or are they just burning lumps? There is now um, briquetting industry, um, but, and that, that's related to the stuff I'm doing now, this is all exposed. But interestingly, most people are much more interested in making charcoal dust from crop residues and keeping it to put on the farm rather than briquetting it. Um, that, let, me go, let me get into that later. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, what is briquetting? You take charcoal dust and you turn it into a briquette that you can burn in a Jiko. Jiko being the Kenyan word, the Swahili word for stove. So what's the timing of this? So this is the defense of over one season, or how many, it is three years, but these three are, years are early adopters and not adopters. These are all single season effects. So one, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I guess what's well, your time period of the data? So it's three years. Three, and three, three, three. Years three you have early adopters and which years you have both. I have. Um, let's go back to this. Um, I lose these guys, and um, so I have three seasons of adopters over three time periods, um, and that, and this, sorry, and. The difference between this and this, the treatment effect, is for is the estimated effect of beginning to use biochar um, on yields in the long range. And you add this difference to, to this distance, which is basically zero, um, or actually depending on wherever you are on the fertilizer spectrum, and you get an estimated treatment effect, depending on what season it is. And do they add more every year? Um, they do. I um, am only using data on single seasons. Um, I uh, like you know when I when I when I see those people at the end who I kicked out and people in the beginning who I kicked out. I don't have nearly enough of them to really do anything with. But um, the evidence is suggestive of increasing yields over time. I can't really hang my hat on it. And other stuff like you know scientific literature on biochar, it's also quite suggestive of increasing yields over time. But is the recommendation that they, they add more biochar every year, or they just do it once and it lasts forever? I can't say anything about recommendations um, because it's so new, really. But um, evidence is that you get benefits in the in, in the beginning, and even if you stop using it, you continue to get benefits over time. Um, nobody knows optimal allocation rates. Nobody knows. Um, People are starting to learn about how effects change over time dynamically, but that's that's soil science, and I'm not super well prepared to talk about that today. Okay. Anyway, um, so there's this. Um, next step. So I think I have pretty reasonable, you know, evidence for efficacy under smallholder management, but this isn't scalable. These people are collecting charcoal dust from markets. This is not going to drive change in a really big way. Um, so enter rechar. Um, basically, some idealistic 20-somethings with a startup and venture capital um, who have a factory in a shipping container that they ship from Texas to Bungoma, manufacturing farm-scale pyrolysis kilns. Little, um, they're basically oil drums. I'll show you some pictures in a second. Oil drums that people can use to turn crop residues, such as maize stalks or sugarcane trash or whatever, into biochar, um, not wood. They, they could use wood, but nobody does. Um, so will they be adopted? Um, Will benefits under sort of a scalable scheme be similar to benefits that you can expect, um, or benefits that we saw in, in among early adopters where something wasn't scalable? Um, the answer isn't automatically yes. Um, and you know, because you know, I'm getting a PhD, um, can we use this as an opportunity to, to learn anything more general, um, some some degree of external validity about technology adoption, particularly about technology adoption with environmentally relevant technologies that maybe global actors want to promote? Um, so enter rechar on the root of a kiln. Um, Joseph again. Um, sort of this is sort of step by step. You take an oil drum and you fill it full of this is uh, this is sugarcane trash. This is the leaves from sugarcane after after you harvest uh, the stalks. Fill it full of that. You light it on fire. Um, you um, so rechar. I, I wish I had better pictures. I don't. Um, rechar never got back to me with some better pictures yesterday when I asked them. 
Um, you basically, they, make, they, they do some modifications to the inside of this kiln that you can't see, um, and they make these lids which have strategically located air intakes. Um, what happens with this system is, um, well first you light it on fire and there's a chimney and there's a, um, oh shadow pointer, there's a secondary air intake up at the top that allows air to come in um, to the top of the combustion zone. And what happens, um, I, can, I can geek out on the technology about this if, with, later if anybody's interested, but what happens is you have a, a combustion zone up top which burns the flammable gases and there is an oxygen starved area, an oxygen starved zone which moves slowly down the kiln, um, which in that oxygen starved zone, the biomass is pyrolyzing, giving off those flammable gases which are then burnt when it gets up to the top. Um, and it's, it's not the most technologically um, sophisticated thing, but it's relatively cheap. One of these things costs about the same as a 50 kg sack of diammonium phosphate fertilizer, um, and it's a durable good. Um, there are much more sophisticated techniques of making biochar. You can get energy out of it too if you spend a lot, if you, if you spend a lot of money on capital. Um, but this, so far, is what Rechar is selling, and I think it's probably going to approach for this particular. Sorry, is you can share like, how many people can use this? Could you go in together and purchase it? Or? People, you certainly could. Um, among early adopters that I'm talking to, that I, that I have talked to, they mostly keep it for themselves. Okay. So um, the, the amount that you produce with it is more just like one farm, which is the size of. So it's it's a good point. Um, this is about half. This is this is after dumping the water on it, so it shrinks the volume. But um, this is about half of the char that you get out of one burn. Um, one thing with this, you need to keep on loading. I mean, you know, you, you think about the amount of corn stalks you get from a whole field of corn. Um, think about how much of that you can fit in a kiln at once. It takes about 10, 20 minutes to complete one burn. A lot of labor. Um, so what, what you see people doing are, like in the morning they'll wake up and they'll do several burns, they'll have their kids do burns, or, um, you know, people, they, they sort of do it in batches, and, um... So one family is sort of using it intensively throughout the entire process, there's not much room for... In spurts, when the biomass is dry and available. And are you going to try to measure labor costs? Um, yeah, roughly. Um, so this, um, I mean, yeah, the labor cost is a function of time, and then I can um, ask them who in the family is burning it and get it shadow wages or something. Um, but um, yeah. So anyway, I wrote a so I got um, I got these cool results from that stuff I did in, in 2011. So I wrote a grant and I was lucky, and I got funding from USAID, um, Development Innovation Ventures. I got a small contract from IFPRI. They have actually some biochar projects in Vietnam and Ghana. Um, a small uh, fellowship from U.S. government's Feed the Future initiative and um, projects under implementation with IPA. Um, so, so next steps, right? Um, adoption. Um, how? I guess my, my main question is: A, will it be adopted? B, how can globally interested actors most effectively and efficiently promote adoption of technologies that have positive externalities? Um, so the process that I'm working on right now, um, we've randomly selected geographic areas just beyond those areas that ReachR hasn't yet reached, it's like sort of a, a throwing darts at a map algorithm. Um, and we're collecting a baseline in about a month. We're also going to collect social network data um, and agricultural data. In July and August, um, we'll install on each, on 5% of our sample, we're going to install four 2 by 2 meter test plots. Biochar maze, control maze, biochar other, control other. So the farmers can see for themselves, and their neighbors can see what it actually does. Um, this is before the kilns are actually available in these regions for sale. Um, come December, kilns will become available for sale in those regions. 20% um, of the people are going to be offered a 25% subsidy. 35% um, of them, um, such a big number because power calculations, um, are going to be offered a one season free trial. Half of those will be surprised with a the delay. They're going to, um, their free trial won't, won't come due um, or become ready uh, until one season later. Um, I'm sure many of you can, can anticipate why I'm doing that. Um, yeah, and what that allows me to do is answer the questions, which treatments increase propensity to adopt? Um, and given program costs, which do so most efficiently? Um, one thing to mention here, um, 
first treatment is having a test plot. I don't think, I think installing test plots on the field of fields of millions of people is really a way forward for disseminating any technology. But the number of people you know um, having a test plot may well be a predictor of, of, and there's plenty of evidence from other, other people's papers that this sort of social learning can be a very effective way of disseminating technologies. That's exogenous conditional on the total number of network links. If you can sort of think of, um, you can sort of think of it like um, you've got a conditional on all the people you know, those of which, the proportion of them that got test plots from me is random. Um, lots of papers do that, sorry. Is, is this the externality story that you mentioned earlier? Beneficial externalities? Yes. Carbon sequestration. So the world gets the benefit and farmers are providing it. That's all I meant. Do you know of any um, research that looks at uh, the difference between, you know, the, the positive externality is supposedly sequestration of carbon, uh, but you're definitely going to emit black carbon aerosol, some methane during combustion, some carbon monoxide. Um, and the, you know, current literature shows that global warming potential of black carbon is, is very high. It's regionally <coughs> temporally dependent and short-lived in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Wh whether the, the benefit you get from burying a kilogram of pure carbon in the form of biochar is outweighed in a climate perspective by the emission of even, even a milligram of black carbon aerosol in the atmosphere over the process of pyrolyzing the, the biomass. So, um, I haven't done that research, but other people are working on it, and I don't think people have looked at it from the black carbon angle yet. I think that um, the black carbon emissions you're getting um, aren't, I think the people who are looking at this, and I'm not sure whether this is right or wrong, but I think people who are looking at that, that exact question are more worried about methane than they're worried about black carbon. Yeah. Um, and, if, and they've done, there's, been, there's, a, there's a few papers I could send you later if you're interested that, um, that say that under very few plausible, under, very, under, under only small portion of the plausible distribution of likely outcomes, would that be a net, a net negative thing? Okay. Yeah, but it's technology dependent, it's also user dependent. Um, so I'm curious about the biochar yield from the biochar. So, uh, about 25%. 25%, so you would need, uh, how does it compare to so like a farmer produces a uh, field that's you know, X size and then they need four fields of that size to actually uh, apply it on that field? Is that the idea? Um, well, I mean, so there's, there's two things. There's, there's what could you do and what do people do. Um, what, what people tend to do is progressively apply it to different parts of their field over time. Um, what, um, in terms of biomass availability, you know, they need it for other things. Um, crop residues are good forage for livestock. Um, it's also a lumpy resource. I mean, the, the nutritive quality of, of maize stalks goes down quickly over time, and once it's dry and the cow can't eat it very well, you can use it for this. Um, you also don't want to use all of it for biotrucks. You need some protection against soil erosion. Um, so does and, uh, it all get used generally now, or does any of it go to waste in any way? Uh, waste would be burning it in the air, and that wouldn't even be entirely wasted because then you get ash, and ash is somewhat useful. Um, but uh, some of it is left in the fields to decompose and provide protection from erosion. That's important. Um, somebody, um, there's a lot of research on this on, on, at Cornell, and one um, one person who I know did like a biomass assessment. And she said, and she actually works in Western Kenya also, and she um, she estimated something along the lines of. Um, absent labor constraints, um, taking into account what's needed to prevent soil erosion, taking into account what's typically needed for an average person to feed their cows. Um, you can get about, about half a ton of the stuff per year if you just make, make as much of it as, as you're not constrained to not make more then. Segue to the next slide. Um, impacts, I'm, I'm surprising people with a free trial timing so I can get an instrument for adoption, which is endogenous. Um, but you know, I'm going to get a local average treatment effect of those who only would have adopted but for the free trial, which is not going to be the same as for an average person randomly selected. Um, it's much better powered than my preferred instrument, which is all the random, all the random treatments. Um, here, um, in addition to adoption, I want to get an impact. Um, so, regressing um, various uh, things that I'm interested in, yield, expenditure, profitability, on endogenous adoption, instrumented by, um, by either free trial timing or all of these random things that I cause. So, um 
are you, are you going to determine this binary adoption variable by, yes, I've used it at least once? Or, you know, that, that kind of go back, goes back to this question, like, how much do you actually use it and how much biochar do you actually produce? And yeah, I, I, that I, should be a binary variable. Um, that's a good point. Um, so I can do this. Whether I can do that, I have to think about a whole, I've, I've thought of and had to put down so yeah, far. Power, power for a continuous adoption. I mean, yeah, no, but it's, it's a really good point, and I should, I should figure out a way to, to think about it. I should, I should, yeah, it's a good point. Um, bigger picture, mm. uh, in terms of sequestration, how does it look? Um, how promising is it? How much of an impact could it make? Suppose this is wonderful, everyone loves it, the whole world adopts it. How much of a difference would it make? Um, that's a big question. But it's a big question. You can shape it any way you like. <laughs> so I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what we don't know and what I'm working on. Um, and what we think we know. So, uh, a lot of the biochar research that's happening in the world is in Cornell right now, and um, this guy, grad student there, wrote a paper, um, I forget which journal it's in, but it's one of the interdisciplinary journals with short papers. Um, he estimated that maximum sustainable technological potential, so sustainable technological potential, um, to be about equivalent um, to be able to sequester CO2 equivalent about 10% of current anthropogenic emissions. That's maximum sustainable technological potential. That's assuming no costs of anything. Um, actual realized potential is certainly going to be smaller than that. How much, nobody knows. Um, I'm working on a sort of a very complicated back of the envelope right now to try to, try to estimate the maximum economically beneficial potential. Um, that's a work in progress. Um, who knows if we'll ever get it done. But, um, but going back to that map I showed earlier, biochar's soil benefits are, in a, are going to be in a subset of, um, of soil environments. But even that's not the whole picture, because not all biochar is created equal. You can burn it at different temperatures, you can make it from different things. Um, you can do it more and less efficiently, which has to do with uh, the stoichiometric environment, which is pyrolyzed. Um, really nailing that down involves either a lot of optimizations, assuming you have perfect knowledge, but you don't, or a lot of assumptions, which it, it's hard to know. Um, yeah, it's hard to know. But, you know, it could be a big thing over time, maybe. The other, the other, the other thing I'd like to point out with biochar is that um, there's a conceptual difference between taking carbon out of the atmosphere, so plants photosynthesize, they take carbon out of the air, and they die, and they give it back off as microbes decompose them. Um, if you can sort of hack that process and um, make it so that that photosynthesized carbon stays in the soil for a long time, which are, most, most climate change mitigation focuses on reducing emissions to the atmosphere. This is focusing on reducing concentrations in the atmosphere. Obviously, the distinction is immaterial when, um, when, um, when we're emitting so much. But over the long term, if, if, if society ever gets its act together to mitigate, we'll need solutions, this, others, um, to actually draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And, and wouldn't it be cool if you could do so at negative cost by increasing crop yields? A lot of the cap and trade things are for these huge projects, you know, pay a developing country to build a window or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this seems like it's so decentralized, it would be a an interesting thing to try to negotiate that. So, what I'm working on is, is decentralized stuff for sure. Um, there are people looking at centralized power analysis systems where they would take big trucks or something and bring all of somebody's biomass to a centralized facility and, and make biochar very efficiently, making it at the proper, what people think are the proper temperatures for best crop yield response, um, and then ship it back and people can apply it according to some scheme. When you do that, you can take all the process heat and use it for energy. Um, which one is better? Um, probably depends on a lot of things that vary in different places. Um, in Western Kenya, it's it's my prior that it's um, that decentralized makes more sense. But um, some of those same Cornell folks are starting a centralized system um, there in about a year, and we'll see. Are there any runoff risks? I mean, regular pesticides and stuff. You have to worry about that. But this is a different thing. So you know, interestingly, interestingly, biochar is actually a sorbent. Um, uh, people are actually one of the thing, one of the people. There, there are quite a few papers by agronomists looking at how biochar reduces the 
reduces the effectiveness of pesticide and insecticide because it absorbs it. <laughs> so you so um, so. I mean, you know, in places where streams have high degrees of seasonal turbidity, you might actually reduce that, and that might be a bad thing. I don't know. Um, but people are people. Ecologists are studying this, for sure. Um, and it's it's still a work in progress. Um, and I guess I was talking about this earlier. What would it mean if I find evidence of impact? Yield increases on poor soils, that would be cool. Um, speculative could improve fertility, generate positive feedbacks, adoption of other things, complementary technologies, if you're, you know, fertilizers or whatever. Win-win, um, could you use um, carbon money to stimulate agricultural development? And, you know, most people, when they hear this kind of thing, should be a little bit cynical, because a lot of it hasn't been as, as true to the intentions of those who set up the programs as they would have liked it to be, but um, maybe it's maybe it's better here, perhaps. Um, and what would it mean if I found evidence for any of the treatments that I'm going to exogenously impose? Um, should we use direct price supports when we're trying to promote things that have carbon benefits? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's effective. Maybe it's not particularly efficient. Maybe it's not very effective. Um, should we try to harness social networks in some sort of, some sort of systemic way? Um, maybe we should let people try before they buy. Um, we'll see. Um, so anyway, thanks. Acknowledgements to various people who have um, either funded me or given me good comments. USAID, uh, Borlaug Fellowship, IPA, David Levine, Margaret Torn, Dan Kamen, Alex the Pinduit Ifpri, the Reedshar and Akon team, my PA at IPA, and helpful comments from some of our people. Thanks.